to hi you guys ginger cook here and it's another story time and as you know story times are not tutorials but i will be telling you a, a, some fun events that may have happened in my life that some people find amusing that i will share with you and um, as i tell the story i'll be painting a painting on a 9 by 12 canvas that has been pre-sold that is going to um, one of our Academy members, PaintingWithGinger.com, who renewed their membership in November or December of 2023. And I try to be, do different ones each time, make it sort of interesting. Uh, what, what is the title of this p picture, John? Uh, this particular one is A Moment with Goldie. A Moment with Goldie. Yeah, you that's what we understand why once we get there. Moment with Goldie. So I'm going to go ahead and start painting. I've already got the outline out. Again, not a tutorial, and I'll start telling us stories as I can, yes? As, uh, you, get, as you get into it. As, you as get I into get it. into it, I'll start telling some stories, right? But uh, for now, um, uh, just taking a white Posca pen and doing a few things that I know I have to kind of save. So today I want to talk a little bit about my time in school and how it influenced some of the crazy things I did in my life. Um, if you've listened to the other story time, sort of a recap, you know that I was adopted and ended up after, um, I was about five years old when I, these, uh, the judge and his wife came into our lives, my sister and my brothers and I, there's three brothers and a sister who was all older, and I was like five. And we moved out into the, uh, they lived in the country of Bellevue, Washington, which is now quite a place on the map, but in those days it it wasn't, wasn't all right? It'd be fair to say that, right, John? Absolutely. In those days it was not really much of anything. But, and so, I, I went to a public school, I went to the first, first and, um, I went to sec. I started. I think I started there in the second grade. I started in the second grade, and then the third grade, my parents had us go to a private school in Seattle again, back again. Um, and then the fourth grade, we went back to public school. And my teacher in that. Um, and that school, I still remember his name. His name was Mr. Lampson. And he wore wool pink pants to school. And you got to have been in the 50s. Nobody did that, right? And he was an artist, and he had great influence on me. And I think I tell a story about how I got the name Ginger from him. And one of the things he, um, he really wasn't, I don't think, a very good teacher. But... Um, Nonetheless, as an artist, he had huge influence on me. And he was a, and I got, uh, he, in fact, he even came over on Saturdays and did art classes with, um, at my house with some of the kids in our recreation room. And my mother absolutely loved him. The problem was I wasn't learning anything. Um, they, for instance, one of the things they used to do was, and of course, they didn't identify dyslexia in those days. They just, if you were dyslexic, they didn't know, even know what that was. But I was, I was a terrible speller. I always had been. And so basically, we were given a list of, um, of words to memorize. And then we stood up on a long line against one wall. I can still remember it in the classroom. And when it came your turn to spell, if you spelled it wrong, you got to sit down and do whatever you wanted for the rest of the day. I mean, it didn't matter, whatever, till that was over. It took a while, 30 kids, right? So I'd draw or do something. And so not getting the spelling right really didn't bother me. I didn't, well, okay, I've got to go draw or do something else, right? So I didn't care. And, and I was not getting good grades, but nobody bothered to tell me this, okay? Uh, that was the kind of the issue is that I didn't know, but um, my parents decided that, that their lives were very disrupted by having children in school, 
and they had got my sister enrolled in uh, school, private school in Seattle, where I had done the third uh, third grade, and um, uh, she didn't really like it. So they decided they would send us both to a private school out in Tacoma, Washington, uh, called Annie Wright Seminary, and it was Episcopalian school. And they had they had kids that boarded. Um, if to give you an idea of the time frame on this, I would have told you it was. Um, what I remember most was that um, I think it was Eisenhower was running for election, and Elvis Presley had just come on the scene. And my dad, who I thought was hysterical and funny, thought he loved Elvis Presley music, the Judge. And I, as a kid, you know, I just you know didn't understand why he'd like that at all. But anyway, so that kind of gives you a little time frame. So here I am, um, and the problem was in order to go out to that school, um, I was put back a grade and I had to repeat the fourth grade over. But what that did to, on a social impact, all my friends in the neighborhood were going on to the next grade level, fifth grade, and I was repeating fourth grade. and. So basically, what that um, what that did was kind of make it where we no longer had anything in common, and it kind of ended our friendship. And then, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, I I know they thought because I couldn't spell that I obviously I needed to get um, better education, not understanding spell check would happen someday, and wouldn't matter what whether I spelled right, but you know. Anyhow, so I ended up in this school, and we were, it was a boarding school, and it was just awful. Um, it, it was the most restricted school. When you went in, they had very impressive, like a grand staircase, I got a, something out of Gone with the Wind, and they were called the Senior Stairs. And only the seniors were allowed to, um, to use them. So if you wanted to get up to your dorm room, you had to go down like a whole bunch of halls, past all the classrooms, and up a long way of black, crummy-looking sta ordinary stairs, and then down some halls to get to the, our dorm room. That's where I was, to get to where my dorm room was. Now my sister was three years older, so she was in a different dorm, but I, I, I wasn't in a room by myself. There were other there were other kids in my room that I really don't remember who my roommates were. I just know that on weekends, my sister and I were really the only ones in the school. Everybody else went home somehow, and we were, we didn't. And on Saturdays, my mother had um, my uh, therapist uh, come out and do a um, uh, an hour session with me. Came he out came, to the school? came out to the school, drove out in Seattle. It was like an hour, hour and a half drive in traffic. So they paid him to come out, you know, which was not cheap, right? So they made so he made a house call. So he made a house call, and you know, me and of course, you know, that gets around, you know, you know, it does, right? And how old were you? I was in uh, what, fourth grade, just just in the fourth grade, which should have been in. So I was like, whatever the re regular age is. Remember, I I started school early, because the but the governesses there when before the adoption had put me into a a school in Seattle, and and so I had started the grade early. So my parents thought I'd be better off in my own grade group. I don't even know that I had done that badly, with the, except for the spelling in school. I don't remember getting bad report cards. I don't have any memory of that, right? So, I mean, I really don't understand what the big deal, huh? you know, what the deal was, right? But the, but the deal was is that um, um, I um, found myself repeating the same grade over and, you know, losing my friends at home. And the whole thing was, you know, if you think that it was very to me, it was very traumatic because I'm, I'd under, I think I would have understood if I had understood I was doing badly in school, 
But I didn't think I had done that badly. Does that make sense, John? I didn't think I had done that badly. Yeah. Nobody said, you better shape up or you're going to be sorry. It was just, I think it was more my parents not wanting to do kids anymore. And they, it was a good excuse that we both went into this private school. And the, and because it was a religious school, there was, they had this big church inside, big chapel church thing. And you, and you went to chapel in the mornings and in the evening and, and, and after dinner. And then on Sundays. Every day? Every day. Oh. Every day. Every day. And, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, honestly, honestly, you guys, that was just, what is that? That's too much, as they say in The Price is Right. It was too <laughs> much. And I think kind of the things I remember about that was we had a, I didn't eat at the same table as my sister did because, of course, she was older. But um, we, um, uh, we had we had something called napkin rings, and I think I've told this before, where you had to wear that. You know, you had to use them again. You, you got a new napkin once a week. I don't know what the point of a napkin was. You weren't supposed to use it, I guess, or get it dirty, because once you got it all full of food, that it was nasty, and you still had to use that napkin. They might have replaced it twice a week. I don't remember. It seems like it was a long time between you got another napkin. Okay. I would say that that's a fair um, estimate of what happened there. So... Uh, the um, upshot of all this was is I really didn't wasn't a big fan of school. I liked my teacher, and she was older. She just she was in her sixties, honestly. Then, and um, and one of the things that she had us do was we learned we learned handwriting, and she taught us to use the circle method of drawing circles which has made my paintings so possible. Learning how to use the circles when I learned, you know, doing those circle exercises. So drawing with, from your shoulder. Yeah, from drawing from my shoulder and writing from the shoulder. I needed to be in that school and I needed her for a teacher. And if you believe in anything like, something like you were meant to be where you were meant to be, I was meant to be with that lady, you know, absolutely. I was meant to be with her. And, um, and and she was the right teacher the, for, for me, okay? For, particularly as my, you know, kind of lifetime art goal, right? That being said, um, the life at the school, I mean, we learned, they had an indoor swimming pool and um, I learned, I really probably learned more to swim there. I had done some swimming at the Y and I learned to swim. And, um, you know, there was a, and I, and I remember winning a big art contest at school, inter, international. I think I told that on another story where I won, I guess it was honorable mention, but nobody else in the school had won anything. So that made a big deal for the art teacher. Um, so that part was, you know, uh, better. But uh, it was it just, I can't tell you, it was just lonely. Couldn't really make friends with the kids in the class. You, could, you couldn't go over to their house for, you know, or have, go for a play date or anything like that. You were trapped in that prison of a school. It might as well have been a reform school for as much freedom as it gave me. Does that make sense, John? It was just yeah. really... Um, and how old were you? I was, well, let's see, fourth grade, what would that have been, like nine, maybe? Now, remember, we spent all summer at summer camps. Just came home long enough to have the name tags changed on the clothes. And then here we were off to 
this other school. And then they got the site. The therapist is visiting me on um, uh, on Saturdays. Dr. Kaufman came out. He was a big deal child psychologist. Now my mo adopted mother was a big believer in psychiatrists. She felt that the trauma that I had suffered as a little kid up until she, I ran into her in our life, being uh, raised by just people hired by the bank that were pretty awful. She, she thought therapy as something that just, my sister wouldn't go, she wouldn't have anything to do with it, but um, somehow they had convinced me to go. And um, so this guy would come out and talk to me and uh, but except for him there was really um nobody didn't have you know and then on sundays my i can still remember we could see the parking lot from a window in that in an alcove window on the dormitory floor we could see the parking lot of the school and on sundays my parents would drive out from bellevue and we would eat, we would go to this creepy old hotel. Like, I mean, it was like old and awful. I mean, I don't know, you know, they had a dining room that was all fancy, but it was, it was just creepy, right? And we would, we would eat at this hotel, we'd have dinner at this hotel with my parents. And then they'd take us back to school and that was it. Now, what was interesting about that was that um, my sister and I, sometimes they'd be late, and we'd sit there and we would wait. We would look out the window, maybe have a book, and look out the window for maybe an hour or two after we, you know, we knew they were supposed to come at a certain time, and they didn't show up, and we'd be just waiting for them. And then... Um, my mother was one of those people that um, made life difficult anyway, my adopted mother. She was not a fun person to be around. I don't remember any happy dinners with them at all. My goodness. Well, I say all in all, you haven't turned out bad. Yeah, right? Despite all this. Well, I think maybe the therapist helped, right? Now, did the other kids get therapy too? No, just, well, my brother Jensen did, and the others didn't. So it was just you and Justin. And then Punky, and he went to my mother's therapist. The Dr. Kaufman, apparently, there was a, there's a school in, in Seattle now, it's where all the rich kids go. It's called Men, um, uh, I'm trying to think what the name of it is, but it was, uh, Dr. Kaufman was the child psychiatrist for all the rich kids. And, um, so, you know, my mother being the social climber that she was, she wanted to have her kid, I guess, you know, I mean, it was just then she could say, oh, yes, my children are seeing him too. So anyway, so Jensen saw him from that school, and I'm trying to, th I can't think of the name of their school, but it'll come to, come to me eventually. And then um, my... Uh, uh, and then, and then I know. Then she had a therapist she was going to see, and she had my brother going to him for a while. And like again, it was it was honestly it was a sort of a it was a fad thing. Does that make sense, John? Yeah. It was sort of a fad thing, but also when she when she got me, remember I was five years old when I first met her. I was prone to throwing temper tantrums. Had oh, already I find that hard to believe. Had already attempted suicide once. Oh my. And I think I was three. And knowing darn well I thought I'd just go to the pills and they'd be sorry. So you know, so I don't think that she was wrong in sending me to the therapist. But we never really discussed why I was there. It wasn't like I was going to be a serial killer or anything. So, with being raised by them, it's possible. <laughs> Just 
they were just, John, you just can't imagine what, they were just such a piece of work. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, anyway, so Coffin was at the, at the, at the she was, he was my school therapist. And, uh, uh, you know, again, which was, which was, was a good thing. Probably, because if he hadn't come, there was nobody. And when he didn't come, if he didn't come to see me, I had nobody. And we didn't go home on weekends. Just, all the other kids got to go home on weekends. We didn't go home. So my pony was home. All my friends were home, assuming they'd still talk to me because I wasn't in the same grade. Um, yeah. But... Um, So then I remember, you know, I didn't tell the story on my birthday, but I had told this once before about my birthday in, in, at uh, that school. It was my birthday. And so my dad had a, a, a bailiff that was, you know, and he, he picked me up at, um, at school and drove me to the house out there in Bellevue, and my parents were not there for my birthday. You getting this? There was a cake and a one present, and I think there was the maid, their maid. That was all that was there, who I didn't know, because she was a new person. <sighs> and then um, I was driven back to school. So you're driven home to have one present, a cake with a stranger. Yep. And to take it back to school. Yep. Do you remember what the present was? Just curious. No. I wouldn't either. No, no, I didn't remember. But the thing about that was, I guess, the thing about that was, is that, um, You know, they just, I remember years later, because I really never forgave them for that. I mean, even in fourth grade, I knew that was, that was some BS, right? You know? I really never, never forgave them for it. But what I did, what I did, um, I remember when my mother, she was living in this retirement home, and my sister, and I was living in um, California, my sister was living in Seattle, and she she didn't have a lot of extra funds, and so we, um, uh, we went in on, I, I would just send her money, and we'd to buy Punky a better, you know, birthday present. You know, and so she had sent. So I, I don't know. She got a. Um, uh, Jeannie had got her a sweater at some, you know, some store. It was real pretty. And my mother, my punky called me up. And she says, "I'm not going to thank you for this birthday present because I don't know what you and your sister were thinking." But there's not even a label on it. I don't wouldn't know. It doesn't fit right. I wouldn't have any idea where I could take it back. Let me tell you something. You know, it, it maybe in the fourth grade you could intimidate me, but now I'm older, right? I'm in my third. I'm going what? The intimidation days are over. Yeah, and I'm going what? And she's going, oh yeah, well this birthday present you sent is just bullshit, and you know she didn't like it. She probably didn't use the word bullshit, but she didn't like it. And how I how dare we have sent it, okay? And she said, you know, at least if you'd sent me some some mixed nuts, um, you know, I could have given them to my guests. And I remember saying, 
Mixed nuts? Are you serious? Do you know where you live? Most of those people don't have their teeth. You can't possibly be serving them lunch, are you? Are you serving them, are you serving them nuts at their cocktail parties? Oh, my God. Right? And then... Then she goes on about the no label and all that stuff. And remember, this is the lady that used to cut the labels out of her clothes and sew them in others if she had something expensive. So people thought she always would shop at these posh stores. So, um, and then I said, well, you know, we sent you something. I said, I don't remember you sending me anything for my birthday for years. And she says, I don't even know when your birthday is. I'm going, well, there you go. Right? Just. And how old were you when they adopted you? Five. And it's, and, okay. Yeah. No, no, it's shocking, okay. isn't it? I mean, just, just shocking. Yeah. Um, just shocking. And so, you know, there was, I don't know, it just, you know, kind of the, when I would, I would call that the, maybe what, the birthday wars as far as, you know, how I felt about things. And, of course, you always had to do something for her birthday every year. And then when my, um, uh, I mean, when she decided to commit suicide, she did it on my, she had a, she was having a birthday party for my sister and um, invited everybody over in the family to um, the cousins and everybody, maybe 30 people for all on her, their side for dinner, invites my sister, maybe you guys remember this story, and then she's on the floor and she'd called my sister up the night before in, to make sure she was coming to the party because the thing was my sister's birthday was on Mother's Day a lot of years it fell on Mother's Day and so she never felt like and we always celebrated Punky always got Mother's Day celebrated from her even though she was certainly not the mother of the year she managed to get somehow con everybody into celebrating Mother's Day right and so my sister always felt chipped and I guess she had said that that it was too bad and so my mother said oh no then let's have a special party for you Jeannie and we'll um, and we'll um, and and we'll have it here at the club. And they would say, you know, their their uh, retirement home where they would save their they would get a meal ticket with their dues. And if they if they didn't eat in the dining room, they could save them. And then then they could have a whole bunch of people uh, come for free because they'd save these meal tickets and they could invite everybody for dinner, the family. And then they like to do that because. Um, it, it, a, a retirement home like that is a little bit like a boarding school, having been in boarding school and knowing how that works, right? It's a very much like a boarding school in that the atmosphere is, I mean, you, that's where you're stuck. They never went anywhere. They just stayed at that, that home, right? Um, you know, that, and there was two of the floors were um, medical, okay? So... Uh, uh, anyway, I've talked about, so you cared what people thought. People would say, these are my children, they've come to see me. Well, suddenly, you need some children to show up to see you. Otherwise, you, you know, the gig's up. People are going to find out that your kids hate you and no one's coming, right? <laughs> okay. So it was important to have these events so that the that their friends could be rest assured that they were great people too. And honestly, I know this sounds very cynical, doesn't it? But um, suddenly they needed us and nobody wanted to come. Because having, you know, having an evening with them wasn't exactly all that, you know, wasn't all that fun. And uh, like I say, nobody particularly wanted to come. So here we've got, we're just, uh, here we've got, uh, um, well, 
my sister, and um, she shows up for um, my my mother's uh, uh, for her birthday party early. My mother's out, you know, flayed out on the floor, unconscious, and has been that way, you know, for most of the day. Though she had just called my sister the night before wanting to make sure she was coming to this event, okay? And I, I mentioned this because they had these buttons all over the um, apartment that they had, two bedroom apartment condo there in the building that they could push at any time and, um, and get, um, and get help. They could, if they were in any kind of trouble, they could absolutely get help, right? And so, um, I think you guys had heard that story about what happened with my sister. It's on one of the other story time ones about my sister finding her and um, all that, right? But uh, anyway, so like I say, birthdays were sort of an issue with me and them. And so, you know, Annie Wright Seminary um, was um, one of the schools that I remember liking the least of all the boarding schools that I, I went ended up going to. And uh, and I, I've forgotten how my sister felt about it. She's she died at the age of sixty three. My sister, I I only have two, I only have one brother still still living now. Um, well, my sister was an alcoholic, and um, she just um, had done a lot of damage, and so she she again was she didn't, like I say she 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 sixty sixty three I think was how old she was when she uh, passed as I sit here and tell the story so anyway so we're telling these stories about um just to give you an idea about uh so you know, you can see that in some in some areas of my life, I was very disillusioned with school. Uh, the, the 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 video I did on on going to boarding school and how I ended up you know in Switzerland was because they had we had gotten in a giant um, argument, my my parents and I. And I was the last kid at home again, and. Um, and they, they said, well, we'll send you back to Annie Wright Seminary and you'll end up going back there for school. And I'm thinking, that's never going to happen. And I said, well, uh, you can do that, but you can. I'll have Dr. Kaufman tell them that I'm crazy and they'll, they won't take me. See how that goes for you. <laughs> 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 yeah, right, right? <laughs> no hostility from this child, right? Just... Yeah, you might maybe you might want to reconsider that, lady, right? <laughs> so, uh, anywho, uh, when I um, got to Judson, uh, which was the boarding school in uh, Arizona. Um, I, I did. I can't remember if I talked about how I graduated a, a year early. Did I talk about that, John? Yeah, we had that in one other one. Yeah, we talked about how I had just worked the system, worked the system, and ended up graduating a year early. That's an interesting one because my parents came down and didn't show up for that one either at the graduation ceremony, even though I thought I was rather brilliant. So. I'm uh, I'm ending up so that fall. I went back 
I, I, I enrolled in Arizona State University. And um, was um, uh, you know and, and ended up in a in kind of a dorm room there on campus with um, with no car and Arizona is a big place but if you don't have a car to get around in it's very tough. Um, Remember, I'm 17 years old, and I'm at the school, and I don't have a car. Now, my parents were afraid to give me a car, and that was because um, the, everybody in uh, my other brothers, my brothers and sister all had had rather bad accidents, automobile accidents, and they just didn't want me to have a car. They just didn't want me to have the car, 17. I mean, I remember when I got my driver's license, uh, when I was 16, I got my driver's license and I wanted, I was headed, I was headed for boarding school at, um, in, at Judson in Arizona. And so I had some friends that, that I wanted to go do, hang out with and, and, and take the car. Now, uh, let, let's tell, talk a little bit about the car. My dad had a car, and then the trust fund bought my mother a car that was supposed to be it's technically in my sister and my names. It was our car, but it wasn't. It was my mother's. That's the car she used. Okay. So um, uh, when I wanted to take the car, I was told I couldn't take it because you know, and then just a few years, you know, just a few months later, then they decided it was all right for me to take it. I, I, I never really understood any of that, right? But you can kind of appreciate how weird this gets, right, John? Yeah. Well, yeah. So far, it's, uh, it's ranking number one. Yeah. All right. So, so when I get down to Judson, I don't have a car or rather Arizona State University. I don't have a car. And I really don't have any good way to get around. Okay? I, I just don't. I don't have any way to get around. And it's a kind of thing if you have to, for instance, I took all these art classes, college, took all these art classes. And the um, first thing I needed, I needed to do was to be able to... Um, to uh, to get, I had to get downtown to some sort of a watercolor event, and I was too shy to ask, was too shy to ask any of the kids there to give me a ride. You know what I mean? I didn't know them. I didn't want. You know, now, nowadays you would just, hey, I I don't have any way to get down there. Would you mind giving me a ride? How does that sound? Right kind of thing, right? Yeah. But then I was just, you know, I couldn't do that. You know, I just. No way I was going to ask anybody for a ride, which I know is kind of silly, but that's, you know. That is kind of silly. But, you know, I was still at that age where if I went out on a date, I wouldn't let anybody, anybody buy me any food or anything. I had to pay. I always insisted on going Dutch. Well, where were you? Yeah. The girl I, was, I needed. Yeah, I always went Dutch. Because I we had money, and I always thought I had probably a lot more money than the boy that was dating me, right? And so I just didn't feel like it was um, it was fair to ask somebody else to, you know, pay, pay for food when I could just easily pay for it, and I had a pretty good allowance. So and anyway, another story, but so. With the exception of the, um, with the exception of the art class, uh, um, I took the art classes and I struggled with those a little bit because I they were stupid assignments, and they were just you know I I really was probably I was just probably too young to be there right, but you don't know that when you're kids you just you know you're there. You think you ought to be able to do it. So I ended up seeing a therapist 
when I went to school. I went and found myself a therapist in Kaufman, sent all my records down, Judson, and I had this, my parents wouldn't get me a car, so I had bought a Vespa, and I could then uh, ride the Vespa to see my therapist. This is back in the time when girls did not ride motorcycles. It just wasn't done. I was an anomaly. But I had seen those movies, you know what I mean? Like the, 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 uh, on, uh, where they were riding Vespas all over Europe and in the, these fun movies, remember? Maybe you, you never saw those, John, but... No. But there were movies that they showed that, okay? And um, so... I, you know, I got the Vespa and it was, I could afford it. And then I joined the Vespa Club. All right. So that, that was neat. And I was the only girl in the club. They were happy to have me. Guys that owned the store. And, well, the thing of it is, is that now you have to understand, the guy that owned the store, the, the only people they had pictured on top of those Vespas were, were girls, young girls, right? Models. They were women. There were no guys sitting on the Vespas. No, no, they had real motorcycles. But they, but the Vespas, they sold, they sold the Vespas to guys. Trust me, the Vespas were being sold to guys. Yeah. But there were no guy pictures. There was just girls, right? Kind of hot-looking babes that were riding these things. Okay. But in our club, there were only guys. Yeah. Hmm. And, uh, yeah, you say, really? And I'm going, yeah, I say, I say that, really. At our club, there were absolutely, they were just guys. And um, so anyway, I, like I say, I was the only girl in the club. And we would go out on, on weekends and ride around and do stuff, go places. That was fun. So, um, you know, I, I, I liked everybody. They were very nice. So come that Christmas, I had, uh, my sister was um, married and um, living in Aspen, Colorado, and invited me to come up and spend Christmas vacation with her. I don't know what my parents were doing, but th there was not an invitation from them to spend Christmas. But I was going to go see my sister in uh, Colorado and Aspen. And I had seen her uh, just briefly over the, um, at, at Thanksgiving. I'd gone up there on Thanksgiving too. But now she had, when I went up at Thanksgiving, she was renting a, a, a house. And, uh, but when we went up the, um, when I went up at Christmas, she had bought herself a house, really nice house up there in Aspen. She had this house. And um, <coughs> so I, you know, being able to go see her was kind of, you know, that was fun, right? So I had gone up t t to see her and, and gone skiing. I mean, we'd go skiing, and I mean, it was a lot of fun. We, you know, I'd go skiing, and then her husband was this, you know, he he was this drug dealer guy. And you know, back in the days when nobody knew anything about drugs, at least I certainly didn't. And in fact, I, you know, probably then, you know, totally naive when it came to stuff like that. But um, she and her husband weren't getting along, and. Um, they never should have gotten married, but she had this, you know, she had Alice and her baby. And um, so she was sort of trapped at home. She couldn't go skiing. She was sort of trapped in the house. And her husband was out partying at night. Which I get basically, let's face it, she was really unhappy. Okay. So she and I got into this really big fight. Uh, probably about Jeff, her husband Jeff, gotten in this really big fight, and um, basically I moved out. She just told me to get out of her house, like you know, you know that was it. 
I could just get out. Yeah, you're going really, yeah. So again, I had allowance, I had some money, so I could, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. I went and rented a hotel down, a room at a hotel downtown, and I had, um, I had, you know, I could take care of myself, so I had a plane ticket to get back to school, and I didn't really need, need her, you know, to stay, really didn't need to stay at her house. Would have been nice, but, with, you know, and I still had this ski vacation that I was trying to, you know, do. So, um, so then I was thinking that I really didn't want to eat alone. And she had introduced me to Colby as one of the town. He was like 27 at the time. And, um, and he was um, considered one of the town millionaires. Wasn't true, but that's what he came off like. He didn't work. And he just skied, and everybody thought he was worth a lot of money. He had enough money to live like a retired person. He certainly wasn't a millionaire. But, you know, when the, that's what my sister said. And I thought, well, I'll go be nice to Colby. I'll go sit next to him and see if he wants to go skiing or something. So um, Colby was, was kind of burned out by what he called ski, ski bunnies. These are girls that um, come to Aspen for, you know, for a vacation. They, they have a little bit of a romance going, and then they leave you flat, and then they're gone on to their lives, and you never see them again, right? And he had almost a stain for what he called ski bunnies. Total, total disdain for these people. Anybody that was kind of like that, he wasn't a big fan of. But anyway, um, I didn't know any of this. Um, I just being the optimist I was, right? And um, I dated a few other people there in town too, but I, I just thought that maybe, um, um, that, you know, maybe uh, Colby would be the person to, to hit, hit up for a free meal and he could take me to dinner. And I didn't need the free meal, you understand, but, and we'd go skiing, right? I was a very good skier, not as good as my sister, but I was a very, well, I probably was, I just never saw myself as that. I spent all that time skiing in Switzerland uh, a couple of years before, so a couple of winters before. So, um, yeah. Um, he and I hit off on a conversation, and... Uh, so we started skiing and going out, and it was nice. He had a little, um, uh, he had an Airstein travel trailer that he lived in in a trailer park up the road. He had a pickup truck. I didn't think about, you know. I mean, there wasn't anything all that special about, you know. And um, again, he wasn't, um, we'd got, you know, he always ate breakfast out at this one place. And, you know, he just had a routine. Does that make sense, John? Absolutely. He had a routine of what he did with his, you know, and how he got by with, um, you know, in the world. And so, we, like I say, we became uh, friends and, you know, romantically involved, I would say. That didn't, you know, and again, um, if Colby was 27 and I was, eight, you know, 17, he was like Peter Pan. He, he never grew up, okay? He just stayed that age. Just can't explain it, right? And uh, I can relate to that. He stayed that age. He wasn't ever going to grow up. That was just it. Yeah. So again, we we became friends. But what one of the things that Colby was at those days, he was the most extraordinary liar. He lied every. He lied all the time. Um, and he just, he had a perfectly good, he'd, uh, he'd already served some time in the military in France, okay? And um, he, he did not, he did not, he was, you know, the Vietnam War hadn't started yet. So he'd done his military service. He, you know, he'd very smart, been to boarding school, in, in military school, South Carolina. And, um, but he had this friend, his name was 
Red, Big Red. Red was a, a guy in his 40s, and he was a, he was a um, house painter in the summer, and then he used unemployment to go skiing all winter. That's what his deal was, right? He had a trailer there in the trailer park. And um, he, he figured out that he could, he could uh, kind of, you know, milk the system for all it was worth, right? And um, so anyhow, the, uh, the, the issue is that him and Red would get together and we'd go over to some place for the, like the Red Onion after dinner and um, maybe have dessert. And, uh, and him and Red would tell stories. And, and they were believable least to me, because it didn't occur to me that he was lying. Does that make sense? It did not occur to me that he would lie about it. I mean, well, why should he? Well, you know, I don't know. See, that was the thing, John. I didn't yeah. know why he should lie. You know, why should he lie? Because he was lying. He was just making all this stuff up. And um, You think he was trying to impress you? Um, he did it. He did it to everybody. Him and Red had this thing going where they had this, this little steal, and they did, the two of them did it together. But because I was still believing it, you know what I mean? I, had, I still hadn't caught on that he was making this stuff up, right? Because I hadn't. Um, he just, uh, you know, he just kept on with it. And as it became obvious that we might um, uh, that if we if we kept dating, for instance, I don't know why I thought we would because I was, had to go back to college. But he came up with a story about that after he got out of the military, he was approached by the government to just run errands. Didn't know what that was about, what they wanted to do, but sometimes he'd pick up a package and take it somewhere. Now. Again, I got to tell you, this was before there was a, a, a movie called James Bond. James Bond movies weren't even out yet. But basically, he goes on to tell me how all this eventually um, translated in, into, in him to becoming. He says, and sometimes I'll be gone for days and I can't tell you what I do, but I just have to be gone. And that's just, you know what I mean? Now, in his mind, he was just making scenarios of how, you know what I mean? Like somebody trying to tell their parents they're going to sneak out of the house, right? He was making up a lot of this stuff. I mean, it was crazy, right? So, um, I, I, I didn't know what to think of it. I thought it was true. And then I was so intrigued, I thought, well, that would be a good job, you know that? Because basically, he basically told me, he said what he was was a spy. And he, and he only told me in the strictest confidence because he was never supposed to tell anybody. And he was letting me in on a big secret, right? You know, you know what they say about two people can keep a secret if one of them's dead? <laughs> you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you guys, I believed him. I believed he was a spy, and it sounded great. It sounded like so much fun. And he went on to tell stories about what he'd done. He started off as a courier, and he was doing this other stuff, and you know, it was all good, right? And so, um, you know, it's, I don't know. It just sounded like the best, right? It sounded absolutely like the, like, like the best fun. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to be a spy. I mean, come on, you guys. I mean, the way he told it, who wouldn't want to be a spy, right? And we could be a spy together. This just sounded great. I was just all excited about this. So when I get back to school, end up going back to school, I start looking at what kind of classes I can take that would allow me to be a spy. Maybe there was some class I could take at the university that would, would facilitate this spy stuff, okay?
That's a good idea. You know, and so I'm looking at the curriculum, and everything had a lot of prerequisites. You didn't get to become a spy overnight. They particularly wanted you to spend some time doing stuff if you were going to do anything, and not understanding how the CIA worked or any of this stuff, right? So, um, so then I thought, well, I just am not talking to the right people. I need to talk to the school counselor, my counselor to see what kind of classes I need to take to make this spy stuff possible. Yes? I mean, obviously, um, so I went to her, this lady, and I remember going in there and saying hi and, and then telling her that I wasn't sure if I was at the right school because obviously what I really wanted to be was a spy, and I didn't see what classes I could take to be a spy. And she was looked at me very carefully, right? <laughs> and um, yeah. she said, um, well, how did this come about? Why do you think that? So? Well, she said, I can't talk about it much, but I've got a friend, and that's what he does. And that's what I want to do, too. I think that would be a great career choice for me, you know, kind of thing, right? Yes and yes? I think it's a perfect idea. So she didn't last laugh me out of her office, which she well could have done. But she did uh, call my mother. <laughs> <laughs> who then got on the phone with me, and I'll never forget the quote. She said, I didn't think it was possible, but I think you're getting more immature every day. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> she read me the riot act, and in the meantime, I was not to be deterred with this spy stuff. I thought I could still be. What did they know? They hadn't met Colby. He was very crude. He was a spy. I could be one too, man. Absolutely. I could, you know, because he, he said he was, and why would he lie, right? I mean, that was just my thing, right? What did they know? Maybe it was more secret than I thought. So I thought, well, maybe what I could do is I could get a job as a store detective, you know, maybe catch crooks, you know, like shoplifters, okay? That's a good story. I could start with that, and then maybe that, that, that then Colby could get me recruited if I could do that. So, um, now I, obviously, I, didn't, I did not need the money. So I go to this employment agency, and there's this lovely man, he's in his 50s, and, you know, the college kids come in and, you know, wanting jobs, and, and I fill out, I said, what do you want to do? And, and I told him that um, I was being thwarted by, um, by being, um, be, from becoming a spy by the school, and they weren't gonna, you know, with a lot of prerequisite classes, and I thought maybe I could just jump the queue a bit and become a store detective or something like that. What did he think? Now, he didn't laugh me out of the office. Okay, guys, he didn't laugh. He's so sweet. He says, well, how about a job working in an art museum? You're an artist. I could probably get you a job doing that. Said, oh, I don't need the money. I don't want to do that. I want to be a store detective. And he just was very nice, but he said, I'm sorry. I don't, a lot of store detectives, we don't have anything like that, and you're only... 17, by the way, and you're not old enough to be a store detective. <laughs> Even if I could get you a job on that, you're too young. You can't be a store detective. You're only 17. Wow. Man, it's brutal. Really? It was going to be 18 in, Jan in February. This was January. No, Yeah, I mean, that's brutal, man, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so unkind. So anyhow, I thought, well, screw this. These people just don't get it. What I'm going to do is um, I'll just go, I will just go see Colby. That's what I'll do. I'll just go see Colby. Go get advice from the expert. Yeah, I'll go see him and move in with him because he, he did like me. I knew that, right? Um, and I did. Um, 
I did. I just I, then I thought that's my big plan. So I left um, left school before the next semester was starting, and uh, got my Vespa together. And I had a I had a beautiful uh, parka that my mom had gotten me from this fur shop. Seattle for Christmas one year. Um, I got back from Switzerland, I think, and it was a wolfskin parka, and it had a wolverine uh, hood that never fr fr frosted up around your face. It wouldn't, um, the wolverine wouldn't, wouldn't collect frosty stuff, right? Yes? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I had that, and um, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever I could carry on the, the bike, right? So what I, well, that's all I had, right? Whatever I could carry on the bike, and so I had that, and um, um, it was December, it was January. I wasn't 18 yet, it was January. And I looked at a map, and John will tell you that map reading is my forte, and certainly <laughs> wasn't when I was um, 17. And I looked at the map, and I'm going, okay, well, let's see. Let's see here. I can, um, if I start here, and I drew a line in the close, closest road, and I said, this is the way I'll go, the, up kind of by the Grand Canyon, um, through um, uh, uh, and then up to um, Flagstaff and then um, th then I'd go to the Colorado to um, tell you, you know, and then I would go over what was called the Million Dollar Highway back then, that's what they called that and uh, I'd end up in uh, I'd end up in Aspen. So I didn't tell Colby I was coming for some reason. Didn't mention it. And um, my sister and I were speaking again, but. Um, I'm happy to just change a lot of things here. I'm waiting for stuff to dry rather than run the dryer. I'm just moving around on my painting. So, but before I left, I had my motorcycle, my Vespa Club. So I remember the guy was married and that owned the place. So I thought, that, you know, there may be a lot more spies than we know about, you know, and maybe they're just hiding in plain sight, right? So I started asking him these questions like, do you ever find yourself, you know, just having to leave town, not telling anybody where you're going? I, I asked him all these questions. Now, in, in hindsight, I know that this man thought I was trying to pick him up, right? And um, uh, it, I mean, it was really funny. The conversations are hysterical, if you could have heard me asking this stuff, because it made no sense at all. You know what I was, um, what I was, what I was saying or doing. I mean, that was just nuts, right? And uh, didn't remember asking him that. And he um, finally he said, what, "What's this all about?" And um, I told him about because again I couldn't keep a secret. I told him about my friend that was a spy up in Aspen, and I thought maybe he was a spy too. And yeah, I mean, there's no James Bond movies out there. This was before that, but he said no. He didn't know anybody else that was a spy, and he thought that was pretty far-fetched, but tried to talk me out of it. I said, well, I'm going to go see him. And um, that's my plan. So I'm going to take the Vespa. Now, th what kind of Vespa did I have? I didn't, didn't really mention this, right? But what I had was was what they called a a, a, a ninety, 
Ooh, it, it, the top speed was uh, was 50 miles an hour. Okay, top speed. And um, yeah, there's there, there was um, yeah, too crazy for words, right? And uh, anyways, um, so the Vespa Club decided to make a, a ride of it. And um, they rode out of town with me for, until uh, we got to, um, the, I think it was Flagstaff. It's where we stopped, where they stopped. We all rode in a group out of there and then they said goodbye and wished me well and <laughs> one guy was probably glad I wasn't his kid, right? <laughs> and I was dressed, I looked like a polar bear. I had this, I had a jacket on and then I had the fur parka on top of that. It was and, sort of this... What time of year was this again? January. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, oh no. There, there's absolutely... I mean, there's no, no rhyme or reason to this, right, John, as far as... Not that I'm no, yeah, no. So, um, anyway, we, um, get out some color mixing stuff here now. Oops. Gonna have to move some stuff around. And I can't remember what I did with my stuff. But the one thing I do kind of remember what I didn't do was my mother had given me some paintings to put on the wall of my dorm room. They were some horses that she thought I'd like. And I left them. I just left them at the school. I didn't take them with me. I mean, man, she never got over the fact that I left her paintings there. And I just, because Punky had a way when she was, she was an artist, my adopted mother, and she, she would give people paintings and then, but they were always hers. She never, even if they bought them, my sister-in-law bought some from her and she came back, you know, years later and said, those are my, those are my paintings. I want them back. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and so the idea, you never really got a painting from her. You just... It was provisional. If I ever want it back, you better pony it up, kind of thing, right? So what what had happened for me was that um, she, I I didn't get, I didn't get the um, I I didn't get the um, the, the, I didn't get those paintings back to her. Because I, I don't remember what I did with all my stuff, but they they didn't end up home. How's that? So the when we were riding in the motorcycle group, what I remember the most about that, when I was riding with them, was that um, I was getting very tired. And uh, I fell asleep when I was riding on the Vespa. Oh, that's probably not recommended. And almost went off the road. So... Um, yeah, you don't want to do that, right? I would think not. And uh, so uh, the upshot of it was is that um, after that, I, I made a real point of, um, of, of making sure I was awake. And if I was tired, I just stopped. 
So then it started to get cold. Okay, we're up in the high Arizona desert, up at high, pretty high altitude, and it's starting to get cold. The first night, I kept on going after I left the guys in Tucson. I kept on going. The first night, I ended up this uh, the, like the Bates Motel out of Psycho movie, right? Remember Psycho? Yes. And um, it was scary. I mean, I was it was scary in that hotel room. I gotta tell you. And um, so I, I remember um, taking the the Vespa inside the hotel room with me so nobody would steal it, which was probably not stupid, okay? And got up, I didn't sleep very well, and I got up the next morning and just took off. And uh, it was really, um, it was really cold. And I was, even with my wolf parka and the wolverine trim and all of that stuff, it was cold. So I was at a service station getting some gas, and it cost maybe 50 cents to fill up the tank, okay? Ah, oh, the good old days. Right. I was at the service station, and... Uh, there was a very nice couple, a couple, and they were, you know, Native American Indians, and they were there with their pickup truck, and we got to talking, and um, they said, "Where are you going?" And I said, "Well, I could, there's something called Four Corners in the United States. That Four Corners is where four states all meet at the same time, same place, it's called Four Corners." And they they said, "Listen, we'll give you a ride." He said, "Put your Vespa in the back of our, of our, um, um, truck, and we'll, we'll take you. So they did. It was very kind of them. They were very, very nice, and, um, didn't have to do that, because there was no traffic. I mean, this is not a, a well-traveled road. There was nobody on that road for miles, right? Something had happened. I had broken down. I didn't know if anybody had seen me. You know what I mean? And it was cold, and it was winter, and it was January. And it was just, that was just, may I say that was just dumb, right? What I did, but nonetheless, I did it. So, uh, so anyhow, they, again, they were extremely, extremely nice. And, um, uh, and did that. And, and so that was the first, that was the, that was the second day uh, riding up there. And then the following, uh, so from there I left them at Four Corners and I made it to Durango, Colorado. And there's where I decided to call my sister Okay. And let her know that um, I, I was coming up. And I think uh, she got very alarmed. She says, where are you? And what are you doing? And where are you? You know, kind of stuff. She's being three years older now. And so she called Colby and she said, Ginger's on her Vespa. And she's um, she's head, 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 heading our way, right? So Colby got in his pickup truck, and uh, he headed out, uh, you, you know, to the other side of um, Durango, to where you know he 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 decided what he was going to have to do was just meet me. Okay, so sitting here thinking about painting all this and telling you the story. So, 
that first night, I remember spending the night in this hotel in Durango. And um, I went to this gas station the next morning and uh, to gas up. And the guy said, where are you going? So I'm all dressed up. I got a suitcase tied to the back of it and everything. He goes, where on earth are, where are you going? Right? Kind of one of those things. Hey, where are you going? Oh, I said, I'm going to, I'm heading to Aspen. And he said, and how are you going to get there? And I said, well, I'm going to go up this road here over what's called the Million Dollar Highway. And he said, they call that the Million Dollar Highway because it took a million dollars just to, um, to build it. Okay. And Um, that's a really bad idea that you've got going there, by the way. And, uh, of course, I didn't think it was a bad idea. Obviously, I wasn't, wasn't going to be doing it, right? So then he said, I'll tell you what. He said, gas is on me. Good luck. Which was pretty nice, don't you think, John? All things considered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Good luck, he says. And uh, I'm just having to think a little bit about this picture as I paint it now. Um, so I take off and. Um, Going up the hill wasn't too bad. I did that, you know, about 35 miles an hour because I didn't have a lot of top. You lose a lot of um, speed going up a hill like that, right? But uh, what I didn't understand was that uh, because it was a two-cycle engine, it required um, the gas to be circulating through the motor or the motor would seize up. So subsequently, my I was cruising down the, the hill here, and um, my uh, bike just stopped right in front of a sign that says, no stopping avalanche danger. <laughs> Sounds oh, appropriate. I know, right? No stopping avalanche danger, and this is where we're stopping, right? So, uh, wow, that was a thing, right? So there you were in the frozen tundra. Yeah, and so then I'd have to, I'd kick it over and kick it over and... It wouldn't start. Uh, no. <laughs> no, it wouldn't start. Would not start at all. So then, then I'd finally, it started, you know, and then I'd, I'd go a little bit more. And... Um, and then it would it, it would stop. And I really didn't think I was going to get down the hill, right? Uh, so um, fortunately for me, we did get down. And uh, as I was driving up to the next town, 
Um, this is before, I gotta tell you, this was before cell phones and um, you know, people always think, what do you mean before cell phones and stuff like that? This was before all that stuff. And um, uh, So you're out there with no way to communicate to anybody. Nope. Stuck on the side of a mountain. And Perfect. C C Colby drives right past me. <laughs> and then he sees me and he turns around and he honks. Comes back and we... Um, I, I tell you what, I think that impressed him, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I think he was rather impressed that I was willing to just do that, right? It's real supply material. Yeah, well, by that time, you know, I don't know, but I, th I think he was, I have to say, I think, I rather suspect he was slightly impressed that, um, that I had done that. And uh, so we get, we get in the you know I get in the truck and then we we drive back to Aspen where um, we just drive back to his place and then we become a couple back when people didn't live together like that. You know what I mean this was before hippies. Vietnam War, that kind of stuff. People just didn't do that, you know. So, uh, and we, you know, that was kind of the thing. And then, of course, it finally came out that he had just made all that stuff up about being a spy. And I think he felt a little ashamed, to be honest with you. He just, him and Red would had such fun with uh, messing with people about things like that that he probably thought he was hilarious, right? Of course, it wasn't hilarious. It, it, it totally had me going. Uh, anyhow, um, so when we, I ended up, See, my, my birthday was in February, so I turned 18 in a couple of weeks. And, oh, he had no idea how old I was either. All right. Yeah, that how, was, long, how long have you guys been going out? Well, we went out that Christmas, and I just didn't tell him, right? Why would you tell anybody that, right? <laughs> I don't know. I don't he, conversation. He, I know. He thought I was, he thought I was 18. You know? and, and you were still 17. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, the kind of stuff that gets you thrown in jail if anybody uh -huh. catches you, that kind of bait. thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they call it jail bait. We yeah. used to call it in those days jail bait. And um, so uh, living, you know, in the beginning, living with him was bit of a challenge. It, he just everything had to be. It's, it's a real sock sock folder. You know what I mean? And John's lived with me. He knows that I'm the farthest thing in the world from a sock folder, right? Not even in the neighborhood. Nope. And everything. And we lived in a little tiny motorhome, so everything had to be everything had to be put away too, right? Okay. And his friend, his friends were nice. I, I remember he had this one girl in the trailer park that was older. She was probably about closer to Colby's age. And I remember her and she made some comment about the cat coming back. So I see the cat came back, kind of, you know. And I don't think she liked me. And I think she was horrified, the whole thing, right? But I guess it doesn't really matter, but that's... I think that was the deal with her. And uh, so we, we had a, I would say we had a pretty good, you know, we, we skied. We put the, he put the, he rigged up a, 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 a rack on our, our bikes. 
and um, and then we could ski. Uh, we think we'd go to the mountain, and and we had passes, season passes. I bought a season pass, and then we were able to to ski pretty well there. Like that was our. I, I don't know. With I, I it was a night. It was nice. We had a good time skiing. We would um, and we skied for years. You know, after we got married later, and we we skied for years. We were definitely that couple, that that ski couple, that did all that stuff. We were the skiers. So as I'm sitting here thinking about what else to put on my picture here. Um, I think I'll leave on my fish and come on work over on her. But everybody had said, you know, what's the spy story? Well, I, that's all very crazy, isn't it? Yeah, we all have dreams. Well, I mean, then you know, sometime later, you know, you know, the James Bond stuff came out, and um, that could have been you. Yeah. Well. I think the only goal I ever had was to be an artist with this one one lapse <laughs> in judgment that was all that was always my goal anyway was to um was to do art and be and be an artist and when we were in Aspen, my goal was to get into all the art galleries in town. It's interesting, shortly after uh, um, Colby and I got married that, that May, went up to see my parents and got married. Meantime, my sister had moved to Hawaii and uh, was renting out her house. And we we had kind of come back from our uh, of our honeymoon in Hawaii. Colby and I did, and discovered that the lady that owned the trailer park where we were at was selling it. it was for sale. And uh, uh, we were going to have to move, and, we, we, and there was no there was nowhere to go. So we ended up, that's how we ended up buying our condo. The trust fund bought me the, bought the condo. Um, uh, but before that, we went and we rented a room for my sister, who was, um, had rented the house out to, and there were a whole bunch of people living at the house. And a friend of ours named, who became, later became a friend, Lee Janey, was the guy that was in charge of um, you know, it was kind of the landlord, and we all kind of had to ha had to do what he said. And uh, Lee was another one of those sock folders. If you left a spoon in the sink, he'd throw temper tantrums about it. Finally, got to the point where Colby had to tell him, "Listen," I said. Um, if you got a problem with something Ginger did, just come tell me, I'll tell her. Don't yell at her. Because there's a lot of, as I recall, there was a lot of yelling going on in that house when we were living there. And then eventually we got our own place, which is condo, which was really neat because it had a basement where you could do art, art and everything. And uh, loved that, big basement. But we lived in Aspen for for about lived in Aspen for about um, oh quite a while because we um, bought the condo and then um, Cinnamon wasn't born for for, for five for, for for I was I think we were married for five years before Cinnamon was born. 
and um, so we we were at that we lived at that condo a long time, and then we didn't move till she was. Um, I don't know what she was just going to kindergarten is when we decided to move to California. So I'm still playing around with all the details. Now, take a little while, John, to finish this. You're doing fine, boss. Want to take a stretch, though? I don't think if I get up now, I won't be able to sit back down. <laughs> At this point, it's all games, bets are off. You're stuck there for the I'm duration, stuck there now. Yeah. I won't be able to move. I will not be able to move. Um, All right, put this little brush down, try another one. I was fascinated by this picture. Just the whole idea of it was fascinating to me with painting. Do we have any comments in our live chat, John, anything? Uh, well, let's have a look, I haven't been really watching it. Been a little busy over here. Let's just uh, take a look. Anybody have anything to say? Jules has been chased by a grizzly bear, but thankfully it was, he wasn't on wheels. That's always good. I love this painting. I love it too. Love this painting. How about putting red lips on the fish to match the woman? It's not, it's not a cartoon. Sorry. Yeah, it's not a cartoon. This is real life. It's not a cartoon, friends. Nope, could have all quiet. People are loving the story and loving this picture. A moment with Goldie. Yeah, a moment with Goldie, right? Yeah, sometimes you just need to talk to somebody. And not hear all the chit chat back. Exactly. Am so. I right? Yep. Yeah. And you wonder why I have such wonderful stuffy staff. I rest my case. Yeah, so the funny thing was is that, again, Colby was, again, there were a lot of stories that he told me that I had not realized were not true, even after this, even after we were married. I thought a lot of them were still true, just because he hadn't cleared. He was very cagey about, well, you know what he didn't do, though? He didn't ever announce it. By the way, I have this kid who's 30 and they're coming, he's coming to live with us. I, he never said that, you know. Talk about lying, right? But, you yeah, know. That's true. That's kind of a... I mean, there's lying and there's lying. Yes and yes. Yeah. But, um, uh, let's see if I can do this. I'm going to take this down now and um, move this over where I can see it closer.
So you start finishing, finishing this picture up. Well, what happens is you've got to have enough layers on stuff. I think people don't realize that. So story time as far as Colby went in, in Aspen, we just, like I say, stayed there for a bunch of years. And then when Colby took up hang gliding, he, uh, he wanted to do it in Southern California. And um, we had a neighbor that had moved in next door that was, was an older lady and she really hated Colby, absolutely hated him. She was the mom of one of the tenants there. And uh, she just went out of her way to be awful. And it, and then she pretend like it hadn't happened, and she was older, and she got away with it. No one, no one would believe it that she was acting like this. So, finally, Colby got out and videotaped her. We, uh, the, I guess he just used his movie camera, but he he filmed her doing it because I mean, again, she would just do all this outrageous stuff and. Um, no, like I say, nobody, nobody believed it because it was, um, well, I guess I, I, people just thought it was, well, she was so sweet and she would never do that. You guys are crazy. That would never happen. But I, I have heard a thing for us. Um, leaving Aspen, and I'm certainly glad we did. Uh, even though it was nice to live there, it, it, living in a tourist town is really a challenge because um, the the local businesses don't have to give you any respect at all because your business is not important to their. Um, their livelihood. Here, I mean, um, if you, of course, particularly with social media, but even back, even back then, um, even back then, if you were, um, if you, if your business, you know, gave somebody a hard time, um, and people complained, you'd be out of business. And restaurants. Generally, it's hard to make a living anyway as a restaurant. So if you mess with people too much, um, you'll find that, um, you know, they'll just, they'll go eat somewhere else. But in a tourist town, that they've got more people coming right after you. So they don't really, they don't really care if, if, if you're coming or not. You say that was a good, ex you know. So, like places where, and that's and that's um, one of the disadvantages of living in a tourist town is that um, you know you got you're just at the whim of you know the businesses can be snotty, the restaurants can be snotty, and you know, and you and your, you know. Too bad. 
Aspen was an interesting place to live in those days because it had what they call a music festival in the summer. And um, the, um, a big, big deal with the music and film festival. They had it now. Now the big film festival is in, um, of course, Utah. But back then, um, there was this music festival in Aspen, and you know, you got dressed up and you went to events. And there were all these kids that would come to town for, you know, they had a big, they had concerts, and these 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 students would be there um, to. Uh, To be, you know, you could walk, you could walk down the street, and there'd be, you know, where the, the, somebody would rent a hotel in, you know, a room in one of the hotels, and that their their violin music would be coming out from the. Um, you know, you could hear all you could hear all that. It was it was lovely. It was just there was something very nice about it, and you had the summer people. And then you had the winter people. And the the summer people again were the you know more the the concert people and that stuff okay and it might take so much paint to get layered before you can get this effect John it's amazing I've been trying to do this all day. And, uh, and I remember one time we went, Andy Warhol uh, was exhibiting his artwork at uh, the first time I ever saw it. And um, he was just coming into New York. He was the one that, you know, painted a realistic pi picture of Campbell's soup, oh, yeah. for, for realistic Campbell, and told everybody it was art. Remember him? Everybody believed him. And he was in New York, and everybody believed him, and he was a big deal. And we had gone to see a movie, um, and we got, it was a premiere. And I'd gotten all dressed up to go to this one theater that was just part of the music successful theaters, right? And um, in the lobby were his paintings. And... John, I gotta tell you that um, you even be. back then I had opinions. <laughs> I find that hard to believe. And I'm looking at what on earth is this CRAP? What is this stuff, right? Who in their right mind thinks a, a, a Campbell soup can is art, right? Maybe the first guy that did it. Now, I can tell you that when I was a little kid going to um, my parents would, my dad at one point used to drive me sometimes to my private school in Seattle when I was a kid. And I remember that um, there was a sign, in those days, there was a, God, I hate people that say that, but it's true. In those days, there were people that instead of uh, the printing signs, they had somebody up there hand painting them, okay? So I remember as we um, would go to school, um, all the time, and we're going to school. I remember watching this um, one guy paint this this beer beer commercial sign, and it was so cool because honestly, you could see um, you could see, you could see the bubbles. And I was as a he was hand painting that man up there on this thing, and I I can't tell you is it. But it's amazing where your influences come from, but that that certainly influenced that was certainly an influence for me, John. Yeah. That 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 guy painting that um, painting that that stuff. I mean, I I couldn't believe it. Um, And 
so you know, I, I mean, I'm not saying that painting a, a, a I thought that was art, even though some people wouldn't have felt that sign painter was an artist. To me, he was a whale of an artist, yes? You know, that to me was real art, but you know, he would have said, oh, I just paint signs, I'm not an artist. But I never thought for a second that Warhol was an artist. Though my agent, uh, Kadriana, if you guys remember her from another... The um, alien. The alien, right? Story. Her sister dated Andy Warhol. Really? Yeah. Well, there is, that explains a lot. Yeah, well, it does, doesn't it? Kind of, you know, when, when, when you think about it. And um, uh, yeah. So anyhow, the. Um, We went to this event at the time. I remember really being hopping mad about that. <laughs> Kobe thought I was so funny. I'm going, can, can you see this? You really, what on earth is wrong with people, right? I mean, just even then, even then, even way back then, I was thinking about that. And uh, the one thing I invent, you know, I've forgotten the movie we went to. Um, forgot the movie, but whatever we went to see, um, I've never forgotten seeing his stuff. Warhol's soup can. And whatever else, like, he had a couple other things there, but it was the Campbell's. And also, I was a big fan of Campbell's soup. Now, see, conversely, for instance, Roman Rockwell was an artist that was the, you know, did the covers of the Saturday Evening Post. And um, he was not considered an artist because he did illust he was considered illust illustrative. But they, they were willing to give Andy Warhol the benefit of, you know, being an artist, right? Yeah, they thought he was, but they, they never gave Norman Rockwell any credit for his artwork. Now they do, but then they didn't then. And as a side point, when I had my artwork um, published by a, 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 a Canadian art company that sells puzzles all over the world. My artwork was uh, sold in. Do we have that puzzle, John, or the one with the, the five puzzles with Norman Rockwell's piece in mind? Oh, let, that me, uh, let me have a looky loo. I'll show you that I got. Um, I thought just getting. Getting uh, included in. In his, you know, in among his um, stuff was pretty cool. Here, I'm going to take a moment and show you. Let me move the painting. This was sold in um, Target Artist Collection. Here was a thousand piece Norman Rockwell painting, and then there's the Cook painting with the slash, and there's mine, and then there's these three other artists. But I thought that having, you know, having a painting that was, this is faded a little bit now, but having a painting that, uh, you know, to be on Norman. the same box with him, I'll tell you what, that's a big deal. But that was to me. Well, I would think so. You know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Exactly, John. Okay, so still working a little bit more on this picture. Oh, 
come along beautifully. Charlie just received her beautiful painting, seen it in person. It is magnificent. I'll post it in a frame soon. Good. Thank you. Great. We'd love to see it when it's um, when it's up, Sally. Um, for those of you who are wondering what this was, one thing that's been sort of fun for me for these story times is um, uh, I'll see, it's not the brush I want, like this one, was the, um, okay, let's just wipe all the water off the brush, the handle. Uh, is is that I've been painting everything, all kinds of different things. You know what I mean? I just I came across this reference, and I just thought this was so cool, didn't you, John? Absolutely. So I'm a little different. Really, I really did think this was, well, gosh, darn it, something really different, right? Um, let's see, now I want a different brush. Well, no, let's see, let's. Let's finish this one out. There we go. All right, now let's get the different brush. But people are so influenced. You know, it's just, um, if they, if for instance, if they see it, you know, if you're watching a, a sitcom, for instance, and uh, there's a painting in the sitcom, a lot of people will think that that's, that's what they want. So it's amazing how we're subtly influenced on what is in style and, and what isn't, as far as art goes. And that was the one thing I loved about our house in Aspen was that we had this basement and I had this big table where I could paint and do art. And I mean, that was, that was wonderful. And I, I mean, I absolutely loved it. And Colby did all kinds, he built all kinds of stuff. He was always inventing and doing things and fixing stuff. And um, so, I mean, it was, a, it was probably, it was a great condominium for us because of that. Um, and when we built our house in California, we designed it off of the the workshop off of that one we had in Aspen. We built something similar. We had the the middle room of the house was that. A little black with that. Okay, I'm kind of getting my bearings back here on my person.
A goldfish memory lasts three seconds. A goldfish mem memory lasts what? Three seconds. So you better talk fast. Uh, is it really? But they, they seem to know when they're getting food. Yeah. You know, I'm just saying. I don't know if that's true. And how do they even know? How are you going to test a goldfish? Well, that's it, isn't it, John? Yeah, come on, people. Let's be real here. I don't know how people are going to test it, but... Oh, boy, it's hard to. It's fun painting on the goldfish, though, I've got to tell you. Um, Oh. I hear a ticking sound. What is that, John? That's the fan overhead. Oh, we forgot to turn it off? Yep. That's going to be annoying to people. I don't know. Nobody's complained about it. Well, I just It know. may be suppressed. I don't know. You, you want me to turn the fan off now? Well, I mean, I can. the damage is done, isn't it, now, right? Well, the damage is done. We usually turn that off, you guys. Oh, we're sorry if it's if offended anyone. Yeah, we're sorry if that fan got to you. Man, I can't believe we know what that The problem happened. with story time is that sometimes I run out of that particular story before I'm done with the painting, and then what, right? Yeah, then what? So people are saying, well, so so much for story time, but, you know, that's why, you know, when you think about most of my friends back when I was, you know, 17, 18, it was most, 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 everybody was married before they were 21. Nowadays, people don't do that, but then people did this because there was no birth control. And I imagine there were a lot of, like, my sister's shotgun weddings. Nobody wanted to talk about it, but there was a lot of that, I think. Because, again, nobody... Um... <laughs> what? You had to change it? Well, you, that's hanging over the middle of the <laughs> Well, I don't know. If you're not watching, I can't tell. Well, you should know I gave you a zone you're allowed to be in. I don't know, babe. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. You need adult supervision. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I have no, no idea of what you speak, right? What? Nothing. Well, here's another one. What? The, this picture reminds me of the goldfish I had in my dorm room at college. He would, he would shake his head back and forth at me if I shook my head at him. People would come from all over the dorm to see him. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. <laughs> see? I think three seconds is a, is a far cry. You think what? I think they I think they can remember more than three seconds.
Yeah, huh? I think we got him. You now you really backed out. What'd you do? I have no idea. You did something. What? What are you talking about? You did nothing. I don't know. It did something on its own. Well, something got flipped around. We well, did a. He did a reset. Well, when we did a reset. I just saw it occur. Hmm. Okay. Don't know. Almost done here with it, so I guess I can. So I guess I'll tell more tales about Aspen. Well, wait. You said something about what happened to the mean lady you filmed. This is a lady you mean to collab that nobody would believe you? What? I know Cassandra's asking something about some lady. What happened to the mean lady you filmed? And I said, what are you talking about? And she writes back, the lady that was mean to C-O-L-L-B-E that nobody would believe you. Oh, the mean lady. All right. Yeah, John Chapman's mother. Oh, John Chapman's mother. It was his mother. And she'd come out from Chicago, and he was stuck with her. And they had, uh, she had bought the condo next to us. And um, so, I mean, um, she, would, she would go get a shopping cart from the store. We all had parking in the front of the, um, of the building. And she would go get a shopping cart from the store and um, park it and, and leave it in the street where we would when we where we would have to park our car. Nice, huh? Right? Yeah. And she adored cinnamon, but she hated Colby, really hated him, and kind of bragged about the fact that she got us to move because um, he didn't want to live next to her. He wanted to. He wanted to go fly hang gliders in California, and um, he had priorities. So it, it, we we didn't want to live in Aspen anymore anyway. So we put our condo up for sale. Now I can tell you a little story about that. The lady bragged to everybody that she was the one that got us to move. That she she was so crummy, but we were moving anyway. But. Um, the um, um, when we went to sell our our condo, right? Um, we wanted to back. I think I told you we had the we had the motorhome and we had the travel trailer, and the, and there was no those days there was no storage. Does that make sense? We couldn't go to you all sh some sort of storage lot and keep your stuff, okay? So, uh, just looking at my picture here to make sure I'm in good shape here. And so our friends that we bought the condo from a, this, this really obnoxious um, guy is, uh, named Hans, and. Um, uh, he um, he had some extra land and he, he didn't charge us or anything. We didn't pay him. He just said, "Sure, we bought the condo for him." He said, "Sure, you can put your your you can put your um, your your um, you can park your motorhome there, or your trailer, whatever it was." We we did that. We parked it there. So then, when we went to to sell our condo. I felt like we had to list it with Hans. I mean, honestly, he'd been. Um, letting us keep the um, the our our vehicles on, on his property for all that time, right? Well, we kind of had to do it, right? So um, 
the um, the problem was that um, none of the other realtors in Aspen would work with him. Everybody hated him. I don't know if he had cheated them out of commissions, which sounds like something he might have done. Um, but if he had a listing, none of the others would touch it. So that really, um, if they wouldn't put it on the multiple listing, you know, that really, um, that really diminished the market. My my ability to find someone to buy my condo, and we were selling it furnished, and um, so anyhow. Um, I had to go around to all the different realtors and say, "Listen, you've got to, you've got to go ahead and please, please, um, you know, help us out with this um, condo sale. We we absolutely need to sell this." And they said, "No, we we won't work with him." And I said, "I will personally guarantee that he doesn't uh, screw you on the um, commission." But uh, please. Um, I'm begging you, please, please, uh, please, please sell our, you know, don't do that to us, sell that, you know, help us sell that condo. And, you know, they did, which was nice, because otherwise I don't know. But there were only two condos in town for sale at that time, and ours, ours sold pretty quickly. So the stuff that we ended up, we sold for the most part, we sold it furnished, okay? But we did, um, uh, we did end up, uh, uh, you know, t carry, taking a few things with us, but for the most part, it was, absolutely was, we sold it, we sold it furnished. And You wanted a new start. Wanted a new start. Well, we didn't have. To, we didn't have. I know this sounds crazy. Colby wanted to move to California so he could fly his hang glider, okay. And we didn't have the funds to uh, uh, for a moving truck, you know, like a U-Haul or something. So we had to take our horses. So we. We rented a four-horse trailer and um, put our stuff in the front part of it and then the horses in the back. That's how we got out of Aspen, which is, when you think about it, that in itself is crazy, yes? Uh-huh. You know, but that's how we got, we got down there. So we, anyway, sold, we sold everything and then, you know, moved down and... Um, the condo doubled in price within six months. Real estate was, you know, booming like that. Um, so, I mean, I think we were, you know, we had a, we had a, what I would call a lucky, lucky escape as far as, um, you know, you know, get, getting out of there when we did and getting our house in California before that, because there was a real estate boom all over the country then. So um, if we'd waited another couple of months, we wouldn't have gotten the property in, in California either. Yeah. So the property would have gone up in Aspen. Um, we wouldn't have had the other so I think I'm about done here, John. No way. Yeah, I, just I think, think so. we just got here. I think I'm about done as far as this goes. I just need to put it in a frame. And um, kind of see. Oh, I guess that's my cue to get up again. Yeah, you think so? I think so. Let's see. Nine by twelve. I have a gold one handy. I think I, I can get a black one. Which one do you want? 
I think gold would be pretty, don't you, gold, on this? Gold with Goldie. Gold with go Goldie would be pretty, I think. And I could just sort of finish her up here. Again, I like this. This is a different, again, totally different new style, different style of painting than we did the other person, right? Yep. Always something new and different here. Okay. Want to do any confirming? Yeah, let me just. You might want to dry Yeah, let's just take a minute. Hold that. Oh, I'm going to hold that for you. Hold that. I'm going to dry the face here. Yeah, let me get that for you. I feel like I'm in an operating room. Not bad. Yeah, I got it. You did. You didn't even budge it a little bit. Look at the yeah. nose and everything. Yeah, just right here under the yeah, nose. Yeah, one little. One little thing right there. Here, I got there. a brush. Right under the nose, just there, just. This is kind of <laughs> stuck now. We don't need it anymore. Yeah, here we can dry. Okay, just one little thing under the nose. That's not shabby. Not shabby at all. All right, I think that's all. I think that's all pretty, pretty fun, right? Well, pretty fun. Pretty fun. Okay. Go mm -hmm. for it. So for those of you who are going to be recipients of this artwork, this is a 9 by 12. Um, we're still missing some addresses from people that um, are owed paintings. That are owed paintings. We're missing some addresses. So if you think you belong, get an address, need a thingy. What is this style called? I don't know. Ginger. I don't know, but it is a definite style, but I've... I'm not thinking very well right now, John. Just all I got here. <laughs> this, this is it for the day, guys. This is it. That's far as mine's gone now. Um, don't have any more. Um, I don't remember. It's not really an abstract. We'll have to we'll have to ponder this one. Not an abstract. No, it's not an abstract. Oh no, it's not an abstract. It's impressionism. Yeah, but just impressionism. I, I I don't know if there's a just or whatever, but it's impressionism, for sure, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. It de definitely is. It's just it's impressionism. And um, just something a little different, a little different for the old taste buds. Yep. Just, just doing, just looking for that one brush. When you're putting your brushes in water, you gotta really wipe them off and then you're just gonna carry water. I need to come up here like this. You gotta really wring them out. I think you're dark enough the eye. Yeah, that eye was was kind of important. To me this 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 painting is sort of is um very contemplative. You know what I mean? This is a this is a kind of painting that you have in your house and people don't say, Oh, that's a nice landscape and then move on. You think about this one.
You know what I mean? This is the kind of painting that you. It's that a conversation you, starter. It's it's that. It is. It's a conversation starter. Yep. And. Uh, Yeah, I, th I would say that's a good example of that, right? Good conversation starter. And when I, I've, I've had goldfish before. I always thought they kind of knew me. We had a, a, a fish. I, I think like birds, the fish kind of know when you're going to feed them and stuff, you know? They, they know these things, John. Oh, they do. I looked it up. They have memories for at least three months. Some people say it's even lifetime. And they can remember faces and people that have been around. So the old adage that they only have a three-second thing, you know, was probably a myth um, because it kept swimming around, just doing laps back and forth and not really doing anything. What? Like there's no TV in their form or anything. What are they supposed to do? No. I would say that's uh, that's probably my main uh, my main thing I'm doing here. Then We've got some great uh, goldfish tutorials. We've got one on YouTube that's really cute that we did a couple years ago or last year, forgotten when, but we did it. I absolutely love this painting. If we, we renewed yearly membership is automatic. It's automatic if you renewed in November or December of 2024. What's she talking about? Somebody's asking about claiming the painting. Because some people did it automatically and they don't know what's going on because they haven't been reading our emails or cassette or listening to us. So Green Heart, if you re renewed at that time, let us know. I don't know who you are by the name Green Heart. You can use to contact us on one of the websites. Yep. We can look it up. All right. I think I'm going to sign her, and uh, and uh, I hope everybody had fun, um, uh, you know, uh, with this. And I look at this, you know, I think I've got a light, and then I turn around, and something got darker on me. Let's try this one more time with a different uh, palette here, and I want a little light, light up here. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that's it, John. I, I feel like we've. It. I think it's pretty. I think we got it. It's a pretty fish. And I really wanted to paint that, so I had fun painting it, and I hope you guys had fun with our show, our story time, and how I once almost became a spy. You know. Okay. Where do you think I should sign this, John? Right here? Up here? Like there, maybe, huh? Probably right along here. Yeah, right along the edge of the bowl there. Yeah. Somebody asked the other day, what do you do to revive a Posca pen? And I didn't know what you did except keep the caps on. Do you do anything special? If it... um, you can pull the nibs out and clean them off in some alcohol. 
and then rinse them off real good, put them back in. That usually revives them. If it could be out of paint, or the paint could dry in there if you didn't put your cap on tightly. Yeah. But the nibs come out. The nibbers. Okay. Well, I would hope that you catch us on. Uh, you'll catch our uh, live show on uh, Mondays. Monday, five thirty central. Five, that's five thirty central. Um, oh yeah, I see something else I did too. Isn't that funny when you look at this? Um, I was wondering about that. I just where's the brush? I see one more thing. I'm, I can just because I'm doing it right. I just. Bring that down here. Okay. I want something dark underneath it. Okay, that was uh, definitely needed to have that happen. All right. So Monday's 5.30. Um, again, we've got some Fun fish paintings. Uh, most of them are all on YouTube too. Our fish paintings, I think. Yeah, we have other fishies. Yeah, we got other fishies. You can look under a playlist for those. So I hope every, if I keep seeing things that I want to paint, I may just turn this off and say goodbye, and then just add a few more highlights. I don't want to keep you. All right, but, we'll we'll bring our little logo over and say goodbye to everyone. Bye everyone. See how I did that? Yeah, look at that, John. Good for right you. Over, say bye everyone. We'll see you on Monday. Bye.